I welcome you all to the technical session on food safety in seafood export. I request all the dignitaries to come on to the dais, please. We are really honored to have Dr. Satin Kumar Pante, Advisor, Quality Assurance of Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. So please come on to the stage. I welcome Sri Jagadish V. Fafandi, National President of Seafood Exporters Association of India, to co-chair the session. I heartily welcome Dr. J.S. Reddy, Additional Director, Export Inspection Council, Dr. M. Karthigain, Director, MPDA, Dr. Jacqueline Johns, USFDA, and Sri Moni Pillai from Foster Frozen Foods Limited. Thank you all. So we have today Satin, sir, who has over 25 years of experience in seafood quality assurance. So we are very happy to have you here today uh, to chair the session. So without wasting much time, I hand over to sir to introduce the session and to uh, take it forward. So please. Good morning, everyone. And this is a, a pleasurable experience to have again uh, back to my field with uh, talking about seafood safety. Uh, as you know, uh, in the over the years, uh, Ampera has played a pivotal role in branding Indian seafood in international market and uh, bringing from few tons of export uh, in 1960s. Now. Got, uh, <coughs> Going across 60,000 crores export is a big uh, achievement as far as India is concerned. There have been simultaneous role by many agencies including Export Inspection Council which has been the competent authority for uh, export for importing countries as many things like starting from harmonization of standards to setting up uh, uh, state of the art, art laboratories across India. and. Uh, uh, making Indian seafood exporters, aquaculture farmers, everybody sensitize about the requirements of importing countries. This has been a challenging task. Of course, we know that there are issues related to food safety in uh, wherever, wherever seafood is concerned. So, seafood is the safety associated with seafood is not only uh, a issue within India or anywhere, but it is an issue um, all over the world starting with uh, the different forms of seafood like starting with canned products to frozen to smoked products. There are various issues associated with that. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we have taken sufficient and adequate measures to safeguard seafood from uh, many of the hazards that we encounter. We have seen the issues uh, starting with antibiotic residues, the challenges faced by Indian exporters for European Union. Uh, histamine issues, heavy metals like mercury, cadmium issues, uh, mercury in tuna and cadmium in supple ports. Uh, up the late we are also encountering issues related to non-tariff measures, uh, challenging the requirements from Chinese and uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, so all these issues we have, uh, we have experienced and we have found out measures to tackle all this. Uh, New challenges that is coming up uh, in export, I will not drag on to this, but I just want to say that the regulatory perspective when you talk about, a regulator also works in sync with the requirements of the industry and also tries to make a balance between uh, the preparedness of the exporters as well as the requirements of this. So uh, sometimes we, we need the help of Empeda to negotiate with the foreign buyers or foreign government agencies. Similarly, Export Inspection Council plays a simultaneous role in implementation of the same within, the, within India. So the challenge that is coming up, for example, I was uh, going through some of this, uh, being a scientist, I go through the research articles sometimes and I found that uh, the, probably the challenge that come up in the future will be antimicrobial resistance again. So if you see uh, some of the case paper that was published recently shows that cooked shrimp has more chances of getting AMR than the normal stream. So 
probably, and there was another suggestion that the cooking process has to be changed. The process that we do nowadays is uh, like you no know, <coughs> uh, six lock reduction of the monocytogens in the product. Probably that has to be rethought about when um, we are thinking of uh, uh, removing the AMR. They found out that more number of AMR are possible in cooked products. It's not good. Related to India, I'm telling the all over the world, particularly for cooked shrimp or seafood, this has been a challenging scenario. So transmission of the AMR uh, through the cooked products is gaining like uh, in international attention now. So these kind of challenges will crop up to us. Apart from that, for example, in European Union case, we have seen the challenges of PFAS and PFOS, which is coming up now. Challenging requirement in the sense we don't have any any of the database or nothing in India. That such hazards are prevalent. Now, from FSSI point of view, we have made now a working group on PFAS and PFOS, which will take help from EIC also to get a background data on that. Is it actually happening or not? Or even so, even though, then there has to be a number of laboratories which will be competent enough to check this. So, India, we have like, uh, uh, you know, although in FSSI look after the domestic trade as well as uh, import, but we have also a primary role in uh, giving safe food to the consumers. So, when these both agencies are in sync, probably the quality of the seafood also will be far, far better. And, <coughs> and there will not be multiply, multiplicity of roles of different agencies, uh, which always you know, complicates the matter. So I do believe that uh, in recent days we have been working closely with TIC. So in many cases, uh, and we find that regulation can be as much as much simple as possible, so that people can really comply with. Uh, with these words, I, I think uh, my co-chair uh, Jagdish ji to give some opening remarks. Good morning to one and all. Uh, good morning, Pandey ji and uh, Vandaji and uh, the speakers today, all uh, eminent speakers, Dr. Karthik and Reddy Saab, Jacqueline uh, Muni, uh, my uh, colleague and uh, co-exporter. Uh, I think Sir has set the ball rolling. Uh, we understand as business uh, food operators, uh, I think the ultimate aim, I mean ultimate burnt is born by us. Of course the country gets a good and a bad name on the basis of how we operate, but uh, the challenges are increasing by the day. And uh, with the help of the government, we are coping up with you know the new food uh, health standards which are coming into the market from different countries and at different times. So I think this is a very important session where uh, we all can you know appraise ourselves of what the of course US FDA is here. She she would definitely guide us also on certain issues, but then. Uh, you know, every country is different. Every country operates at a different level. Uh, India is also a unique country. Uh, it's a large country and uh, uh, all our importing countries look at us uh, favorably and uh, treat us in a way, the way, we are, uh, the way we want to handle ourselves. So I think it's a good session to have and uh, I'm sure we'll all be more uh, learned once we leave this hall. And I think we'll, uh, because food security is a major concern worldwide today, I think we'll be more learned from this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jagdish Chief. So we'll go ahead with the presentations. So uh, we have actually five presentations today and uh, each of 10 minutes duration. So I request uh, the presenters to stick to the time. And we have, afterwards, we have an open discussion on these issues by participants, so we can also talk about that. So, so initially, I'll ask, uh, uh, Dr. Jay Reddy, Additional Director, Export Inspection Council. He will talk about the regulatory perspectives of major overseas markets, European Union, Japan, and China. Floor is yours, sir. Uh, good morning, all. Wal warm welcome to the dignitaries on the dais and of the dais. Uh, next few minutes, I am going to speak on uh, regulatory perspectives of major overseas markets, uh, especially European Union, Japan and China. When we look at the regulatory authorities, which are ensuring the safety of the seafood import into respective countries, 
uh, Director General Health and Food Safety, the DG Sante is ensuring the safety of imported food into European Union. Similarly, import, imported food inspection service division of Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare of Japan will ensure the safety of the seafood imported into Japan from different countries. Likewise, for China, GACC, General Administration of Customs of the People Republic of China is the authority which will ensure the safety of the food entering into the uh, Chinese market from different countries. Whereas, Export Inspection Council will make sure that uh, seafood exported from India to different countries meets the requirements of respective importing country. When we look at the challenges uh, faced by seafood exports, uh, uh, especially my perspective is I am restricting to these three major uh, trading partners, uh, European Union residues and contaminants, especially antibiotic residues we all know. It is not only issue in EU, but for many other countries as well. Traceability of whole food chain is another issue. And uh, recent regulation of EU regulation uh, 2022 bar 1255, uh, this is uh, countries want to export to EU have to comply with uh, this regulation, which is forthcoming very shortly. So, regarding Japan, the issues are similar like uh, residues and contaminants, again antibiotic residues are important. Of late, uh, we are facing issues uh, in terms of uh, dyes contaminated, especially malachite green. And when we look at China, uh, different set of issues we are facing with the Chinese ex export to China, especially this aquatic animal diseases that white spot disease virus and then residues, especially heavy metals is of concern to Chinese. Apart from that, operational challenges like uh, re recently introduced uh, their online system of onboarding the exporters registration, whether it is new establishment or whether new product when we want to export it has to be registered on their system. This is a logistical issue. When we look at the challenges for EU market, uh, residue control, especially antibiotic residue is one of the major concern. As we all know, every country want to protect their consumers uh, because these residues of antibiotics are posing uh, this uh, health hazard, we can say this is a, uh, almost uh, a major hazard for many of the countries in terms of antimicrobial resistance. How to ensure that product? exported from India is free from such hazards. Can we test each consignment for this kind of antibiotic residues? The emphatic answer is no, we cannot test every consignment, it is practically not feasible. The approach should be to focus on testing of the prohibited antibiotics uh, which have zero tolerance by the importing countries and the balance antibiotic residues or other contaminants we should ensure through following national re level residue monitoring plans. Uh, traceability as no, it is a important aspect and it is always used as a tool to control food, food hazards, especially when we in emergency food situations like recalls and all this traceability will help. So, every country insists that uh, traceability of their uh, food they are receiving from different countries up to the production level. Uh, the recent regulation that is uh, EU regulation number 20, 22 bar 1255 uh, mandates that uh, the countries which are exporting to EU should guarantee that food producing animals shall not have been administered certain antimicrobial compounds which are reserved for treatment of certain inspections in humans. Uh, what I mean to say here is that uh, EU has uh, prepared a list of antimicrobials. This is uh, antibacterials, antivirals, antiprotozoals, especially these are reserved for uh, human usage in European Union. So, these list of compounds should not be used in food producing animals of the exporting nation. That guarantee we need to provide then only they will allow the export of such products into their country. 
when we look at the challenges faced from Japan market is like uh, they are again uh, vigorously test for nitrofurans, they almost uh, test for all consignments for this uh, kind of antibiotic residues uh, whichever is coming from different countries. In the year 2020, uh, just before COVID pandemic, uh, we invited Japanese delegation and this Japanese delegation uh, visited India and we demonstrated uh, that entire uh, uh, supply chain, how we are officially controlling, especially this black tiger shrimp and uh, based on their successful uh, satisfaction, uh, they have reduced the sampling frequency from the earlier 100 percent to 30 percent in case of a black tiger shrimp exported from India to Japan. Uh, in July 2023, they ha Japan has increased the frequency of monitoring inspection to 30 percent in case of the dye malachite green and uh, EIC immediately took certain measures of including uh, testing in pre-export testing for this malachite green and uh, Japan recently revoked this additional sampling frequency. So, in the year 2012, uh, number of consignments of shrimp exported from India to Japan were uh, held at border ports and rejected, uh, stating that uh, they are not meeting the MRL which was set at uh, 0 0.001 ppm uh, without any scientific risk assessment uh, studies by Japanese. So, the issue has taken up by Indian authorities at uh, as a specific trade concern at SPS committee of WTO and uh, based on that laterally they agreed for bilateral discussions and finally, we could able to uh, make Japan revise this uh, MRL to 0.2 ppm. But meanwhile, Indian exports uh, of especially shrimp to the Japan suffered for almost a year or 18 months uh, in the process. So, the when we look at the challenges uh, from the Chinese market, uh, the major one is uh, white spot syndrome virus. Uh, couple of years back, uh, they have detained certain consignments uh, stating that they are found positive for WSSV virus and these establishments were uh, delisted or what we can say they are not allowed to export uh, till date. Uh, based on their uh, finding and uh, they insisted for including health attestation in health certificate that the material imported from India to China should be free from WSSV virus, uh, which is a kind of restrictive trade practice uh, because as per OIE anim aquatic animal health code 5.1.22. An international aquatic animal health certificate should not include requirements for exclusion of pathogenic agents or aquatic animal disease that are present in the importing country. So, this issue uh, we are taking up at a different fora. Uh, so, uh, with that episode they stopped and uh, they are not further insisting uh, every consignment uh, for this kind of attestation. And uh, another major issue we faced uh, with uh, China, uh, I think export fraternity also will agree that uh, this is the only country that tested for the COVID-19 uh, nucleic acid on the outer packaging materials on the food product and inner walls of even uh, refrigerated containers in which this material entered into China. This has happened despite FAO guidance that categorically denied that. Uh, uh, this is the not the mode of the frozen food is not the mode of transmission of COVID-19. So, they used to as soon as they find some nucleic acid material, they used to ask for that particular export establishment subjected to video inspection immediately within very short period of time. And uh, based on that uh, number of export establishments have to face uh, uh, disruption in their supplies to the China. But finally, they have withdrew this uh, notification and now exports are happening smoothly. Normally, heavy metal testing is insisted for the especially C cart material because there are chances of uh, bioaccumulation of these heavy metals when untreated uh, water is discharged into these water bodies and then because of bioaccumulation there are chances in these heavy metals in the C cart material not in intensively cultivated plants and others, but uh, China 
test for this kind of heavy metals in all seafood coming into their country. So, in the year 2022 this uh, CIFR that is China Import Food Enterprise Registration they have given a short period of window. So, for uh, renewal they allowed some uh, transition time, but for new establishment they insisted that first they have to be registered on this system software system which took quite uh, some time and uh, uh, some a slight delay was there in getting registered because uh, system was not working and it is difficult to reach them to get their system rectified all those logistical issues we faced uh, from Chinese market. Now almost all exports establishment have registered and some more are pending. Uh, we know some time it will take for the new establishments to get it registered on the system which is mandatory before being allowed to export to their country. And when we have to meet all these challenges, we have a regulatory structure in India and uh, as we know that uh, Export Inspection Council is uh, set up through an act of parliament uh, that is Export Quality Control and Inspection Act with the main objective is to provide sound development of export trade of uh, India through quality control and inspection. When we look at the key functions, uh, it is basically to ensure compliance to the requirement of importing country and analysis of samples to verify to compliance either through EIC labs or EIC approved laboratories and we will issue various certificate of compliance like health certificate, non-GMO certificate and in case of uh, certain basmati rice like that authenticity certificate. Apart from that one of the prerequisite to uh, gain the market access and to maintain the market access implementation of residue monitoring plan for different livestock products uh, uh, as well as for uh, aquaculture and seafood uh, we are following the NRCP which is uh, mandatory for European market. Uh, we are uh, doing this NRCP along with the vast network of uh, MPEDA offices located across the country. Under this NRCP, the samples are collected from the supply chain uh, from different stakeholders uh, uh, right from the hatcheries, processing establishments and uh, even feed mills also covered to ensure that uh, levels are within the controls. Apart from that training and capacity building activities are also there. Basically this control program is based on four pillars that is regulation, inspection, testing and certification. And uh, EIC has a vast network of offices uh, across the country and these are located basically along the uh, length and breadth of the Indian coastline because uh, majority of mandated commodities of agricultural produce are bulk in nature and uh, exported through seaports. So, apart from fish and fishery products, these are the notified products that are that means mandatory pre-shipment inspection and certification is required uh, for these products. So, legal framework for uh, seafood exports is uh, through the government of India order 729 and uh, notification 730 both are uh, come into effect in the year 1995. When we look at the food safety ecosystem, especially seafood ecosystem, uh, the primary production, processing establishment and ultimately export certification. So, at the primary production level, uh, number of stakeholders are working to ensure that uh, food exported from India is uh, safe for the importing countries. Uh, uh, MPEDA is performing the functions like uh, national residue control plan as well as uh, uh, through pre-harvest testing that is ensuring both functions uh, like uh, maintaining the traceability from pond from which pond this particular shrimp is produced. Apart from traceability it also doing the initial screening of the prohibited antibiotics so that uh, any pond uh, by any chance contaminated with any of these uh, restricted substances uh, can be eliminated at the source itself by that initial screening. And apart from that as and when this raw material is received by the export establishment, uh, they are also uh, responsibly uh, testing, uh, screening the incoming raw materials through their in-house ELISA laboratories for certain compounds which are prohibited to enter into the food chain. 
and ultimately finally, pre-export testing uh, based on the importing country requirement and regulation EIC is performing these functions. Because of the coordination of the all the stakeholders, uh, we can see the results. Uh, once upon a time through RASAP alerts were almost 60 in the year 2007-8 uh, which we successfully able to brought down uh, to single digit level and uh, in the year 2022 there was only one alert and uh, this year somehow it again reached to 3 and uh, uh, this kind of uh, control measures are giving confidence on the credible export uh, certification process to the trading partners and the trust once inspected, tested and certified allows the free movement of goods for the different importing countries and uh, ultimately objective is to reduce these uh, type of alerts or rejections. Uh, thank you, thank you for giving me our opportunity. Either. Thanks Redditi for such an enlightening lecture. Uh, we'll go next to uh, Dr. M. Kartikel, who is Director of MPEDA, and we'll talk about trends in seafood exports from India. Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, chair of today's session and my dear friend Panda is now working as the advisor of FSSI and uh, our dear friend uh, from the Seafood Export Association who is the co-chair today, the national president Jagdish Ji. And we have also the additional director from EIC who has given a talk right now. And uh, we have Jacqueline Jones from USFDA. We work very closely with USFD in promotion of exports and we do have an uh, export friend who is going to talk about uh, the infrastructure requirements and the needs of the sector. So today my topic is on uh, the trends in seafood export from India and basically before get getting into the subject, I would like to just give a brief about EMPEDA and its activity. Maybe uh, some of them are new to that and maybe uh, ma'am uh, from USFD is also new. So basically, EMPEDA is an export promotion agency and we do all activities related to the production chain, quality management and also the export oriented production we support. And we ensure that the across the value chain in the production line, the quality is being maintained and the product which is coming out for export is of the good quality which meets out the international standard. And finally, the EAC as a certifying agency certifies it by testing and then it is getting exported. So, EMPEDA have been playing a role for more than 50 years on this aspect and that has helped in enhancing our exports and uh, our friend from EIC was pointing out about the requirement of the quality in terms of uh, the antibiotic related issues as well as on the traceability part. EMPEDA again has taken initiatives particularly on the traceability part. We ensure that the, the material which is coming out for export from which pond it is coming that is being done through the enrollment system which is being adopted by EMPEDA. It is a pond based enrollment system. We take the lat long position and that is being used, the farmers, farm ID is being used for that. Again uh, the uh, marine catches also, the traceability is being ensured through the EMPEDA's catch certificate system. So coming to this topic of uh, the uh, seafood export trend, so you can see that India have exported more than 8 billion worth seafood last year and that seafood from India has reached more than 129 countries. So there is a steady increase in the countries where our seafood is reaching and it's all efforts taken by our exporters with the support of all the government agencies, we could reach 129 countries. And our exports also have grown tremendously during the past 10 years. Uh, we thank uh, US to, for the support just been given by them on uh, introducing Venami in India. In 2009, we could introduce Venami and that has helped us in enhancing our production from the shrimp sector and the shrimp is now contributing for the maximum and we too have now come out with the SPF broodstock of Monodon which will again help in enhancing our exports further. So major countries where we export are US, then China, Vietnam, Japan and Thailand which almost contribute to 70% of the overall exports but US is our major market and US is our good trading partner for the past 
10, 15 years, wherein the major exports going from India is going to US and the US imports maximum from India. And this is all because of the quality which is being assured and the quantum what US requires has been assured given by the Indian companies. So we too have a good number of uh, processing plants which are all having world class export uh, processing facilities and mostly all are approved by USFDA as well as by the European Union uh, competent authorities and we have good processing capacity on a daily basis and last year we could achieve an export production from the shrimp sector of more than 1.2 million metric tons. And this graph shows about the exports over the past 10-12 years. So you can see from 11-12, 3 billion, 3.5 billion we have touched more than 8 and we are hoping to reach more than this during this current year. By so this uh, gives about the change between the two years. Last year we had a growth of 4.5 percent but previous to that year we had almost 30 percent growth in two, during 2021-22. And this is the contribution from the sectors particularly talking about the capture fishery sector and culture fishery sector. From the culture fishery sector though the quantum is less from 35 percent of the overall quantity comes from the culture fishery sector but the export happens the value co comes maximum from the culture fishery sector. So that is ba basically supported by the shrimp sector. But when you talk about the marine sector over the periods the volume is remaining almost the same but the value is coming down because your shrimp contribution is higher. So the volume was more than like 80 percent uh, of the overall export was happening through uh, marine sector but that has come down to 50 and then now last year it was uh, the volume was almost like uh, managing around 50-50 but this year again there was an increase it went up to around 62 percent but still the value wise it is around 37 percent because the unit value realization from marine sector is little lesser compared to the culture fishery sector. So the item wise export if you see like uh, we have done almost like uh, 5 billion and above for the shrimp 5.5 billion around and frozen fish is around 687 million and uh, the chilled item also we are now concentrating upon and uh, the live items also is getting exported from India. And if you talk about the overall export, the US is the major market as I said, like we had a, a good growth till last year but there was a little dip uh, during 22-23 basically because there was a lot of compel uh, stall stock uh, which was available in US which has like uh, reduced the procurement in US and also we had a competing nation from Ecuador which is trying to dump in a lot of material producing huge quantity in lesser number of ponds. So that is where we are facing an issue with uh, exports to US particularly because of the competition faced from the Ecuadorian side. So the itemized export if you see frozen shrimp again this is a repetition of the same uh, data what we have shown. So frozen shrimp is contributing the, to the maximum uh, by value. So the market wise as I again briefed, so US is a major market followed by China and European Union and uh, we also export to Southeast Asian nations as well as to Middle East and Japan is a steady partner for us for the past 20-30 years. Japan is uh, ex importing almost like 0.5 billion worth material from India always. So this is the export performance during this year. This year we have uh, like uh, uh, till September we have the data wherein uh, our exports have shown a little decline in terms of uh, uh, value but in terms of volume it has shown almost like 19 percent of growth but value is little low because in the international community wherein uh, like basically the purchases happening in US or China the unit uh, uh, value has come down the purchase value has come down so that is leading to the decrease in the unit value really or uh, the overall value realization of the seafood exports from India. So this again this slide talks about the uh, month wise exports but from last month onwards our exports are picking up hopefully we are expecting that we will cross the export uh, value compared to the last year tag, uh, last year value. So this the, it gives the global trend of how it, the export is happening. So last year globally it was like uh, 190 billion exports were happening and India's contribution was almost like 4 percent of it and again. Uh, if you talk about the, uh, the uh, trend in uh, 
shrimp export it has reached up to almost like 22 billion and uh, india is well, india was holding the first position in shrimp export till last year but ecuador has taken over now ecuador is uh, leading it with the shrimp export and we are in the second position but hopefully we are a steady uh, player we produce and export quality material continuously and hopefully we will again take over from ecuador and we will continue to supply the quality material across the world so this this slide shows the major importer and exporter of products so you can see like us is the major export uh, importer of product was almost like 35 billion uh, followed by china china basically buys reprocess and exports so that's where the imports are also high as well as the exports also you can see the uh, below graph where exports are also high from china they also do a lot of uh, local consumption japan again it's a good market almost like 15 billion worth uh, imports and again uh, in if you talk about uh, this imports and exports again the value added products uh, the trade is almost like 32 billion which is happening uh, though i don't have a uh, slide for it but uh, 32 billion north uh, value added product export is happening india the export is almost like 10% uh, of the overall export like uh, we have been doing almost like 1 billion worth uh, value added product export hopefully we will be able to dominate in the value addition sector because our exporters are now changing over to the value addition to ensure that we will be able to compete with all the other shrimp producing nations as well as the fish producing nations and we have all world class infrastructure and our uh, exporters are all uh, very enthusiastic in uh, coming out of the new products which are being envisaged by the importing nations and hopefully we will be able to compete in that uh, segment and we will be able to keep up our exports and enhance our exports in the coming years and from empeda as well as from our indian uh, organizations and from the exporter side we can assure that the quality what is being looked after either by the european union or by us or by any other country we will be able to meet out the standards and we will be able to supply the quality material thank you thank you thank you dr kartikeyan it is always uh, enchanting to know the micro level perspectives of uh, export and the challenges faced by india so even i was uh, looking at the last slide about uh, the value addition thing at the last moment you told probably that would be the real panacea for india to tide over this uh, or boost our exports to the 1 lakh crore ex the target fixed by government of india so thank you again and uh, now we'll go to another very interesting <coughs> topic on traceability <coughs> in the seafood sector we have dr jackin jones from usfda so i request her to give the presentation Namaste and greetings. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Jones, International Relations Specialist with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Thank you for inviting FDA to speak during today's World Food India thematic session on food safety in seafood export. Before I begin the presentation, I would like to take a moment to provide a brief overview of some of, India's, um, some of FDA's work in India. The FDA India Office was established in November Oh, so, so, the FDA in the office was established in November of 20, uh, 2008 and serves as the lead FDA on site presence in India. I can go ahead and keep can end with this part of it. Um, oh, you're good? Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Right. And so as part of as our, our mission in country, we work with government counterparts and industry on various FDA regulated commodities. This is important because India is one of the leading nations exporting food and medical products to the US. 
In fiscal year 2022, India ranked as the seventh larger supplier of food products to the United States in terms of FDA import lines. Two food products that account for a large portion of India's exports are shrimp, <laughs> mentioned previously, and spices. One in every three shrimp consumed in the U.S. comes from India. In 2022, India was the largest exporter of shrimps to the global market and represented 36% of all shrimp imported into the United States. So, we are happy to celebrate the 15th anniversary of FDA's India office and recently hosted FDA's commissioner, Dr. Robert Califf, who engaged on an array of in-country discussions and engagements centered on a variety of FDA regulated products. Thank you all for mentioning um, food traceability because today's talk will provide an overview of FDA's new food traceability final rule issued under the Food Safety Modernization Act, also known as FSMA. What I hope you take away from today is an understanding that the final rule is designated to facilitate faster identification and rapid removal of potentially contaminated food from the market, resulting in fewer foodborne illnesses and or deaths. Also, we'd like to have you have a knowledge of the compliance with the rule is important for exporters who are subject to the rule and gain a sense that food traceability could be a means of helping with market access in other countries. And lastly, I hope you get a knowledge of various FSMA and FDA resources available to you. So the food traceability final rule establishes new record keeping requirements for persons who manufacture, process, pack, or hold certain foods, those which are on the food traceability list or called FTL. The additional record keeping requirements are necessary to help FDA rapidly and effectively identify and remove potentially contaminated foods. The final rule covers the entire food supply chain, including retail food establishments, restaurants and farms, and applies to domestic firms as well as foreign firms producing food for US consumption. The final rule covers the entire chain and these are there may be some full or partial exceptions that may apply, but these are listed in the rule, which you're more than welcome to review. So here is our food traceability list. Um, you see here that we have foods that um, were containing, <clears throat> sorry, foods that are listed here are foods that um, may, um, that fall under the rule, but some of these foods also, if they are contained in foods that are made, as in the ingredients, as an ingredient, they must be in the same form. So for an example is fresh and frozen for fin fish and um, seafood, which you see listed on the um, right column. The FTL published with the final rule has not changed from the tentative rule issued with the proposed rule. However, we have provided additional revisions to the descriptions of the commodities on the FTL which address some of the comments that we receive and to provide greater clarity and examples. So let's talk about the framework of the critical tracking events and key data elements that these allow us to standardize the information that we want to receive from industry and that we would like for industry to maintain and share with others across the traceability of supply food chain. This helps FDA quickly identify and go back to entities within the supply chain when an event occurs. So requiring the traceability lot code um, to be kept and shared along the supply chain is also critical to be able to trace back the movement of the food as with the long, with the lo along with the lot code. And this helps to enable FDA to avoid overly um, issuing overly broad recalls as it sometimes has done in the past. And it also helped limit the adverse impact on industry sectors affected by outbreaks. And the records that are also required under the final rule need to be provided to the FDA within 24 hours of request or some time that is reasonable, which the FDA agrees upon. 
This standardized information, as well as requiring records to be provided within 24 hours, can lead to a faster identification and rapid removal of potentially contaminated food from the market, resulting in fewer foodborne illnesses and deaths. So on this slide, you will see um, our foundational framework of the food traceability rule, which identifies key points along the supply chain where it is important to collect traceability information. These are called critical tracking events, or CTEs, and include points where food is harvested and cooled, initially packed for raw agricultural commodities, and first received on land from a fishing vessel for a seafood. Also, these are activities can include transformed, shipped, and received activities. At each CTE, we were requiring traceability information essential to understanding what happened to the food at that point. And these are called key data elements, also referred to as KDEs. This approach standardizes traceability information across the entire food chain, as I said before. And initially, the records required to the CTEs would need to contain and link traceability lot codes of the food to the other relevant KDEs. All right, here's an example. So records for seafood start with the first land-based receiver, which is the person taking possession of a food from the first time it comes to land, directly from a fishing vessel. And this one is called a critical tracking event. We believe that the first land-based receiver will be well positioned to comply with requirements because they are receiving seafood directly from the vessel. And they should readily know the required information or be able to retain it from the fishing vessel itself. At this point, um, this is the first point in the wild caught seafood supply chain where traceability lot code would be required to be assigned. So here we have an example of the supply chain for the wild caught tuna. And that will be sold as frozen whole fish. Just to repeat, the fishing vessel will be exempt. Then we have the first land-based receiver who begins the required lot code record and traceability record. And um, they will keep key pieces of information when they receive, about receiving um, from the vessel. And then the traceability lot code will be assigned at this point by the first land-based receiver, once again. And they are the entity that we consider to be the traceability lot code source, or TLC source. And this is important because the TLC source data tells us where the food was physically handled and provides a location for us to go to if necessary. Oops, excuse me for the noise. So let's walk through this example. The first land based receiver was transform the fish and that by freezing it and packing it. And therefore, therefore must retain the transformation KDE, which includes information about the food before and after it was transformed. So we see that as the uh, underneath the land based uh, receiver bubble, we uh, see the transformation KDE listed there. So also, this land-based receiver is located outside of the United States, and they are going to be sending this product to the, food, um, to the wholesaler who is inside the United States. And in, the wholesaler is also the importer and will be holding the food in the United States. So the importer, for just a note, importers who do not hold the food are not subject to this rule. And since the first land-based receiver is shipping the food to the wholesaler, they have to also keep shipping KDEs, which is listed underneath their bubble. Um, so the KDEs include information about what the food is, when and where it was shipped, and how much was shipped, as well as information on the traceability lot code and the traceability source. So as a shipper, the first land-based receiver has to maintain records of these shipping KDEs, and they will also need to pass them along uh, with the KDEs to the next receiver, who in this case is the wholesaler. If the wholesaler does not repack or change the product in any way, the wholesaler just needs to keep the receiving and shipping records and then send certain shipping information to the next point in the chain. The receiving records most likely consist of information that would have already been sent from the previous shipper. The distributor 
also does not change the product. And they just need to keep the records of, of receiving and shipping and send those forward to the next point in the chain. Finally, the RFE, which may be a grocery store, will sell the product direct to the consumer. So the grocery store only needs to keep receiving records. Okay, next I'd like to provide an example of aquaculture shrimp, which has been on our minds today. <laughs> um, a firm's role in activities in the supply chain will determine which KDEs they need to maintain and share. In this case, we have imported aquaculture shrimp where the importer does not physically handle the product. And since the importer does not hold the product, then they are not covered under the rule even though they may help to pass along certain records to the next person in the supply chain. So you can see the specific KDEs required to be kept at critical tracking events in the supply chain. In some cases, one entity may perform multiple CTEs. For example, the initial packer of the shrimp would be required to keep pieces of information pertaining, pertaining to the initial packing since that same entity also must, most likely will ship the food to the next port in the point in the chain, that entity would need to keep KDEs required under the shipping CTE. The shipping TTE also identifies the KDEs that are needed and that need to be sent forward to the next person receiving the shipment. In addition to, in addition, the seafood processor is transforming the shrimp and so the traceability lot code would be assigned at that point for the transformed shrimp. Since all of these entities are covered by the rule except for the importer, each entity would also need to maintain what we call a traceability plan. So everybody likes to know when we have to be compliant. So we are having compliance date of January 20th of 2026. We feel this provides industry time to coordinate effective implementation of the rule and collaborate their tracing systems. And consistent with approaches of the other FSMA rules that we um, had come out, FDA intends to take an approach of educating before and while we regulate. So on the FDA website, we have food traceability resources. These are just examples of a few, but I would invite you to go to the website to explore and uh, find out all the various information and guidances and rules that we have there. Additionally, I would recommend that you uh, sign up for the notifications and listservs that are available on the set. Okay, and so, I would also like to encourage you all to describe to FDA's Indie Office's LIFTSERV, listed here on the left of the slide. And if you have any questions regarding imports, please submit them to USDA, I'm sorry, USFDA, I know, I got my emails flipped, forgive me. I encourage you to uh, submit them to FDA imports inquiries at fda.hhs.gov. And also, you feel free to reach out to us at us-fda.ino at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you all again for inviting FDA to speak during today's thematic session. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to join you all during World Food India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackie Jones, and uh, you know, this is a something new that has come to us. So although the deadline is January 2026, but we know we'll be waking up just in January 19th, 2026, and <laughs> we'll face the problem. So I think we should also have preparedness for this, and a lot of brainstorming has to be done how to implement this. Of course, this isn't a good intention, but you know, a number of requirements uh, associated with maintaining the data and transform and, and, and you know, passing on the data to the next level. Um, from my experience, I can tell you India was, India had pioneered actually establishment of ISO standards and traceability. India was the lead uh, organization, lead, uh, lead <coughs> country to establish the standard, ISO standards and traceability. I find some aspects of that in this uh, US, regu the US FSMA regulation. So of course, we'll have a lot of questions on that afterwards. Uh, 
Now I'll call upon Sri Moni Pillai from Postal Frozen Post Private Limited, and he will be talking us about uh, investment opportunities in seafood export trade. Thank you, Dr. Panda, uh, and all the eminent speakers. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, certain investment opportunities in the seafood export trade. Um, India already has a world-class seafood processing plant that follow quality control regimes compliant to the stringent international regulatory requirements. And this has transformed India to the third largest uh, seafood uh, produce, producer and the second largest aquaculture producer and the fourth largest uh, uh, seafood producer in the world. Uh, certain figures which I have is of the 1.7 million metric ton seafood exported by India, 41% was shrimps and the frozen fish was 21%. Uh, I think Dr. Kathikian has already shared uh, the data. Indian uh, seafood market is about 19 million tons in 2022, expected to reach around 31, 31 million tons by 2028 which comprising of in inland fish, marine fish, shrimps, campi, etc. And uh, we exported only 7.2% of this volume, probably because of the high level of the domestic consumption, which is a significant factor. Uh, Indian aquaculture market is around 12.4 million tons in 2022, expected to reach uh, around 20 million tons by 2028. International seafood market is $1.04 trillion growing at a CAGR of 2.6% till 2028. We have a lot of focus on shrimps, and as you know, the data shows that India is a significant uh, producer and exporter of shrimps. Uh, but see, in 2021 data, India's fish fillet export is only 2,000 metric tons, whereas China's is 5.72 lakh metric tons and 18,000 metric tons by Thailand. Now coming to the opportunity, um, India has an uh, installed processing capacity of around 35,000 metric tons with over 600 seafood processing plants out of which around 450 are EU approved, almost 74%. That's an average of 57 tons per day per plant. And we're already exporting to US, EU and Japan. They take about 77% of the global fish imports. And Indian processors are already present or exporting to these markets. This gives us a very good opportunity to explore the potential by way of improved utilization of our processing capacity. Our country exported around 17 lakh metric tons of seafood. If you compare that to the processing capacity, it is just 49 times the install capacity. That is less than two months of our capacity. If we increase the production capacity utilization to at least 90 times, that is three months, we can have an additional 1.45 lakh metric tons of production. This additional production capacity utilization will result in additional export revenue for the processing industry and all the associated uh, industries and additional foreign exchange for the country. Now, how do we do this? There are around four to five critical factors which I could identify. One is facilitation of raw material supplies. India has abundant availability of shrimps, but the, uh, the overseas market, especially the US and EU, has a requirement of white fish. That is what is consumed in large volume. So uh, salmon, white fish like Alaskan pollock, cod, these are the products that are required for the overseas markets. So how do, how do we uh, you know, uh, try to gain some uh, market of that? The short term strategy is to facilitate the import of raw material from available countries. Now if you see uh, China, in case of China, salmon is the fish that is important and exported in maximum volume. And these value added products are exported back to US and EU. Another critical uh, factor is the import facilitation. Now, when we look at 
uh, you know, identifying the source for the fish for importing, reprocessing, intervaluated products, and then re-exporting. Uh, the regulatory agencies of India have a major role to play in, you know, setting guidelines in, in helping us identify the sources and also for getting, giving more clarity on doing the uh, import and re-export. Cost impact of the delays in custom clearance is another significant factor. Now, tariffs and duties which will impact the cost effectiveness of the imports for re-export is the third factor that is going to affect this. In the long term, we can look at sustainable farming. With a coastline of over 8,000 kilometers, 2.02 million square kilometers of an exclusive economic zone, uh, 28,000 kilometers of rivers and millions of hectares of reservoirs of brackish water. India has a vast potential for fisheries for both inland and marine resources. We are currently using only 40% of the water bodies for freshwater aquaculture and 15% of the total brackish water resources. Aquaphonics and greenhouse farming, a sustainable farming technique which includes simultaneous cultivation of fish and plants utilizing fish waste as a nutrient source for plant growth in a greenhouse environment is another big opportunity for India. India has abundant availability of land. Sea cage farming in the coastal areas is another way of uh, looking at it. All these are long term strategies, but in the short term strategy is required for us to jump start to move ahead in this plan. This also would need government support to the processing industry by way of infrastructure development of common facilities such as water treatment plants, effluent treatment plants, electric uh, substations, cold storage, packaging units, logistics, ice factories, byproduct processing facilities, uh, which can be made available for collective usage, probably as a paper use facility in special processing zones. I'm sure Seafood Export Association will be able to throw a better light into this aspect uh, with respect to easing of import restrictions, easy clearance of frozen goods, etc. The next uh, critical factor is upskilling of our workers or building more technically skilled workers. I'm sure government can provide financial assistance for getting technical expertise from overseas markets for upskilling uh, native workers by incentivizing processing uni units. Uh, second stage can be through the fisheries training institutes to build up domestic expertise. Next approach for a quick start would be the categorization of the processing facilities that we already have. Maybe a star categorization, which MPDA already has in a way. This will showcase uh, our processing facilities or the star processing facilities for potential processing tie-ups with supply and buyback options of the raw material, which can be pitched to supermarkets and large import houses across the world. <coughs> which will also facilitate easy audit by international auditors and faster approvals, which will help in uh, building trust and initiating the business for a quick turnaround. And once we start doing that and we start getting some traction, this will definitely motivate, incentivize and improve the practices of majority of processors for better financial prospects. In addition to all this, the promotion of technology-based innovation will also help us uh, you know, gain significantly in the, the market opportunities. It will also help in enhancing the value chain and also incentivizing high value addition products in seafood processing, which will also help in sustainability and waste reduction in the seafood industry. Things like fish-based uh, ready-to-eat products, oil supplements and fish byproducts for nutraceutical applications, fish skin for treatment of burns, fish based leather, leather products are few of them. The opportunities for growth are huge. Uh, we need to make the first move. Thank you. Thank you, Moni Pillaiji. Very interesting observations by you. So, so that uh, actually some takeaway points from your, your presentation, we could get it to take forward Indian seafood export and the investments in this sector. So now uh, we finished our presentations.
so the house is now open for discussions and questions from the audience operator as well as laboratories and also to the regulatory bodies so my request is whenever opportunity opportunity comes we should argue with the importing nation that this is not a contaminant of concern i think we, now we are having sufficient data not a single sample pcbs are detected for c coat products so based on that i think uh, we will be in a position to argue with the importing country that will help a trade a lot thank you very much just just to intervene uh, you are telling about pcbs yes sir pcbs polychlorinated biphenyls yes sir are not getting in c coat products not necessarily these are environmental But contaminants uh, the chances of that uh, coming into the system by way of uh, pollution by a coastal pollution by discharge of effluents so it cannot be exclusively out, uh, out I mean, outrightly negated but the second thing with the nitrofuran that is coming up in um, sea cod so sir can answer that yeah as you rightly pointed out uh, this uh, chinese is basically uh, difficult to negotiate with but uh, however as we rightly uh, developing the data Uh, this through uh, residue monitoring plants and all we are continuously collecting the data and uh, every possible forum uh, we will be taking up these issues but uh, till it is there on the regulation we have to ensure that but uh, point is well taken uh, we are every forum we will try to negotiate with them and as you rightly said this uh, even in my presentation i was mentioning though heavy metals are basically concerned in the sea cod material but they they are testing even for the cultured shrimps also so one example i think dr panda has also mentioned how these are entering is sometimes is a tricky issue into the food chain for example i will quote uh, not the seafood product uh, but it is a egg powder egg powder it uh, this contaminant entered uh, and it is detected in eu and uh, as you know that ultimately finding out root cause is important to eliminate uh, and further making that product acceptable to the eu so we investigation team has gone up to the uh, processing plant processing plant uh, there is uh, nothing which is cause of concern or the Uh, entry point of those uh, into the uh, further processing we went back to the uh, where from they are procuring the eggs so in the poultry farm where these eggs are produced so we went there we found out uh, that they have kept an incinerator means for the dead birds and all uh, there are incinerators Uh, which the fumes of that incinerator are entering into the feed storage area so ultimately that fumes entered into feed and through feed it is entered into the eggs and uh, that was the cause of concern always trying to find out root root cause and eliminating is more important uh, and apart from the showing through data that uh, no such incidences are reported in fast for so many years so to Uh, negotiate for easing out the regulatory burden thank you sir one corollary question to you the same line 
like you presented about Japan, like uh, being associated with it, I'll tell you that Japan insists on the parent compound of nitrofuran. Is it still uh, persisting or they've come down to the metabolites of that? Uh, as far as Japan is concerned, uh, uh, they are testing all the consignment. Their condition is that if a country is not reported continuously for three years, then only they think of relaxing any norms. So continuously, no incident in uh, not a single consignment for consecutive three years, then only I think last time we could achieve up to 20 months or something. After that, again, incidents was there. So we couldn't reach to the target of consecutive three years without incident. No, no, my question was a little bit different. And the Japanese requirement was parent compound. So we always face this problem that parent compounds gets immediately metabolized in the tissue. So looking for the parent compound is of no use. Check for the metabolites. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Metabolites. Furazolidone. Furazolidone mm. compounds, yeah. yeah. Any more questions, sir? I'll just uh, endorse the point raised by Kishore because we have sufficient data to prove that certain parameters as per our monitoring plan has not found in a second time in, in our uh, you know, seafood. So we should pitch for elimination of those parameters from the testing protocols which are required as per the pre-export testing. Okay, they can be placed again in the monitoring plan which will endorse, you know, which will suffice the requirement of uh, con safety concerns. Second point, my question is to Dr. Jacqueline. Uh, you are talking about your uh, new uh, regulation which is coming in. And uh, how do you plan to implement? Do you have a device formats for, you know, uh, to collect the data uh, from the each step? Or will it be a web-based one? So at this time, um, we are still rolling out the final rule, and we anticipate more training will be forthcoming to help answer those kind of questions. So when, when do you plan to start this uh, capacity building programs on this? Because I remember that when the FSMA was introduced, when you had the seafood import monitoring programs, you have, we had the speakers from U.S. coming to India and trained all of us, and we went on training the exporters also. So when do you plan to start this capacity building program on this? So in preliminary talks, we're hoping that that would happen um, potentially next year. Yes. But let's stay in touch. So if there is no more question, actually, we actually next session, I think due in this room. Any more questions? President Kuding. Presentation, you saying that a uh, lot of value added products now migrating in India. Just would like to understand what was the challenges and how did you address to improve that? Just want to curious to learn about that. It's as such, there are no challenges in uh, value addition, basically, uh, excepting the ingredients part where the importers or the exporters have to import the ingredients for uh, uh, doing the value added product. That is the only challenge for our exporters are facing. Right now also. Okay. Because I learned, I learned uh, uh, this that it was a huge challenge. Vietnam was able to do and India is not able to do. It was going to Vietnam all the way to do the processing. And India is not ready or cap capabilities are not there. So That's I think what I, my I lost my uh, exporter friend to answer on that aspect because see I can't uh, say that we don't have the capacity to do it. But okay. basically like see the, uh, the purchaser what they are looking for our uh, exporters were able to do it. But when there is a competition level and now we need to compete with Ecuador and take over the market, so we need to get into the value addition. Okay. That's where yeah. our, the importance Correct. is felt and now our people are transforming into the value addition sector. Correct. Or else previously, whatever exports, like right now also Vietnam is dominating and now they have taken over as the third position uh, above Japan last year. Okay. So Vietnam imports from India, reprocess and make it into a value added product and export. Correct. And they have certain advantages in some markets which they are capitalizing. Okay. And the availability of ingredients for value addition sector is one of the major uh, constraint factor and some of the infrastructure facilities. But right now, our uh, exporters have developed all these infrastructure facilities. Okay. Some 
may be the uh, capacity building that again uh, Impeda takes a lot of initiatives they export of themselves bring in people to train and recently also we have connected like some of the companies with the Japanese uh, requirements and trained them so yeah. we are like uh, next uh, month we are going to have training by the Vietnamese uh, trainers who are coming there okay. to train all the exporters on uh, technologists on uh, the evaluation so capacity building is one little lacuna factor in our uh, sector but or else uh, our exporters have all the uh, capabilities okay. to do it and previously it was around 6% now we are into 10% 10%. level and hopefully in another 2-3 years we are expecting it to grow into around 20% level. So that is the only uh, place where we can capitalize and uh, like uh, compete with Ecuador or any other uh, shrimp producing nations. And our labors are there, skill labors are there but only the little addition of skill on the uh, like what you say. Uh, the people say like uh, in one hour how many cages they can do or in mm. one day how many cages they can do okay. that capacity has to be enhanced that's what uh, we need to do okay, okay. we are trying to do it gotcha. and I, maybe i can ask our exporter friend to talk about it uh, no i think uh, basically dr kartikan has answered your question but uh, see necessity is the mother of invention there was a time when vietnam came down to india i was just just told yesterday that when vietnam was starting to uh, become as a major processor uh, they trained out of India and uh, I mean that is how they progress. So uh, and then India started, India was a large quantity producing country both in the oceans and now from the aquac aquaculture side. Uh, the need of the hour was not, uh, we wanted, we, there was an intention to you know sell block because that is how the market moved, our processing capacities were lower at that point of time. But now that everything is in place. Uh, sir also mentioned that we have one of the best processing facilities in the world now. So I think we are coming to a stage where, you know, validation will take a leap jump and maybe in two or three years time, by the time the US comes out with this, uh, uh, this new, uh, you know, uh, traceability, I think we'll be up and ready. I think you'll see a sea change in the Indian uh, seafood industry for sure. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful words by uh, our co-chair. Jagdish Popandiji. So I'll summarize the things. We have four presentations uh, in total. So Dr. Jayesh already talked about uh, the challenges faced by India in from the countries like European and Japan and China in terms of the new upcoming regulations and how India is tackling these challenges. And we had next is uh, Dr. Kartikan talked about uh, the export performance with these micro level, level performance of India and uh, what kind of steps are being taken by Ampeda to boost exports. I do believe always that the value addition is always the answer and not only that we have to increase the test words of uh, the people when we are, when we are exporting uh, so that no, the our seafood gets uh, prime acceptance all over the world. Then we have the very interesting talk on uh, traceability. So we learned that uh, the new upcoming regulation which is to be implemented by January 20, 2026 on traceability, how India's preparedness has to be there. This is a big uh, uh, thought process that has to go on in, in regulators and the export development agencies. Uh, how to go for complete traceability in terms of the critical uh, tracking events and key data element that has to be captured at every stage whether we have to uh, bring blockchain technology or some sort of technology that can be integrated to uh, satisfy these requirements. Then we have a uh, presentation, many takeaway points that we got from Moni Pillai from investment opportunities in uh, seafood export trade. So how we can boost our exports by tweaking some of the requirements, some of the, some of the capacity building initiative that can be taken up at a large scale. So I thank all the participants and especially Ampeda to organize this session. Uh, which is a very important one as far as India's seafood export trade is concerned. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for your presence here. And World Food India has been a grand success as far as showcasing India's uh, expertise to the world. Thank you. Thank you for the informative session. I would request uh, Kartigayan sir to present memento from the organizers of World Food India 2023 as well as MPDA as a token of gratitude to Satyan sir. Please.
the organizers are offering uh, complimentary coupons for lunch as well as food street thank you i welcome jagdish fafandi sir to please come forward to receive the memento from kartikeyan sir May I invite Reddy sir to please come forward to receive the memento from Kartikeyan sir. <laughs> Madam Jacqueline, please come forward to receive the memento from Kartikeyan sir. May I request Dr. Ram Mohan M K, Joint Director, Quality Control, to present the mementos to Dr. M Karthikeyan. Uh, okay, Ram Mohan sir, please uh, present the memento to Sri Moni sir. <coughs> please come forward, sir. And lastly, I request Kartikeyan sir to receive the memento from Ram Mohan sir. Thank you very much. Thank you all the dignitaries as well as the audience. Thank you so much. Have a good day.